All right, Romans chapter number four is where we'll spend our time this morning, and we are uh, certainly continuing our lectionary series or our Lenten series. Uh, for all of you that are hanging out with us for the first time, and you may not know particularly what we were referring to in the month leading up or the six weeks, 40 days leading up to Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday, we always spend a significant amount of time uh, in the season of Lent. It is a uh, global church uh, process or holiday that affords us the opportunity uh, to prepare ourselves for Resurrection Sunday. Speaking of Resurrection Sunday, how many of you know that uh, Easter Sunday is on the way and it is March 31st? which just means that we're, uh, you know, about a month or so away. We're going to have two services, a 9 o'clock and an 11 o'clock service, uh, just because we anticipate the attendance will be particularly significant that day. So if you show up at 10 o'clock, you may be able to catch the last part of the sermon to get you an early little uh, 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 continental breakfast that will be prepared for the transition. Um, but please put your calendars 9 and 11 o'clock. And so the season of Lent prepares us much as we are uh, getting ourselves ready for Easter Sunday. We want to also remind ourselves that there is a journey. There is a path that we all must be on. If we are to have a faith that is vibrant and a faith that is indeed pleasing to God. The scripture says in a number of different places that without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. And so faith is going to be the grounding of our conversation, our sermon today. We're going to go to Romans chapter number four, verse number 13, um, and start there and uh, walk you through the story of a patriarch, a significant figure of at least three major religions of Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. This patriarch is called Abraham. And thus we get the kind of designation, the Abrahamic faiths, the faiths that all derive from a particular lineage to Abraham. Father Abraham, as the song used to say, had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right foot, front, left foot. Right foot. Y'all remember that? All y'all that grew up in church in the Sunday school. Some of y'all like, what are y'all talking about? These cultish songs. Thank God I skipped that part, right? Some of y'all like, I don't know. I don't know nothing about that. But the rest of us who do, Father Abraham, he is a towering figure in our religious Christian faith. And aside from having a physiological lineage connection to uh, the people, group who would uh, produce Jesus, uh, there is also a faith lineage. Uh, and many of us uh, who do not have a direct bloodline into the Israel Jewish uh, cultural heritage, we are indeed people who have been, as uh, the Apostle Paul would say in another part of his writings, grafted. We have been attached into this lineage by faith. And so we're going to talk a little bit about Abraham. Abraham was uh, uh, called by God, had an encounter with God when he was 90 years old. And God told Abraham, you're going to have uh, a son at 90 years old. And Abraham looked at God and said, you know, are you serious? Don't you know me and my wife, we, we ain't had kids yet. And if we ain't had no kids yet, it ain't happening at 90 years old. You want to talk about a late start. God met Abraham, told Abraham, not only going to have a kid at 90 years old, but you're going to be the father of many nations. God met Abraham at the late stage of his life in a space and a moment in his life where that which he had hoped for his whole life had yet to come to pass. And then God makes him a big promise that obviously he could not do on his own. And this is the faith that Abraham, as the scripture says, is counted to him. It is that kind of faith to believe what God said, right? And to then produce fruit that still lasts today. It is the power of faith, and I want to talk about righteous faith. Romans chapter 4, let's jump in and read a few of these passages, a few of these verses. 
and then just uh, challenge ourselves uh, how this may be applicable to us. Romans 4, verse 13. I'm reading from the message translation because there's a lot of scriptures, and I figure rather than, uh, you know, taking the these and the thys and the those, uh, we'll just go plain language translation today. And during our Bible studies coming up, I plan to try to walk us through Romans chapter 4 because it's a very important, rich text for us to uh, be particularly familiar with. Romans chapter 4, verse 13, and the scripture says, The famous promise that God gave Abraham, that he and his children would possess the earth, was not given because of something Abraham did or would do. It was based on God's decision to put everything together for Abraham, which Abraham then entered when he believed. If those, listen to this, who get what God gives them only get it by doing everything they are told to do and filling out all the right forms properly signed, that eliminates personal trust completely and turns God's promise into an ironclad contract. Right? Following me? Following me? That's not a holy promise. The writer, Paul, is making a distinction between a promise and a contract. That our interaction with God goes beyond just you doing a list of things that then create this transactional relationship with God. The writer is saying there is something that unlocks promises, divine promises, that does not tie to your works, but actually is unlocked by your faith. Keep reading. A contract drawn up by a hard-nosed lawyer and with the plenty and plenty and with plenty of fine print. Only make sure that you will never be able to collect. But if there is no contract in the first place, simply a promise, and God's promise that that you can't break it. This is why, verse number 13, if you're reading along, this is why the fulfillment of God's promise depends entirely, listen to this, on trusting God and God's way. And then simply embracing God and what God does. God's promises arrive as pure gift. The, that's the only way everyone can be sure to get in on it. Those who keep religious traditions and those who have never heard of them, for Abraham is father of us all. He is not our racial father. That's reading the story backwards. Abraham is our faith father. We call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life. With a word, make something out of nothing. I love this part of the passage. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway. Deciding to live not on the basis of what he saw he couldn't do, but, what, but on what God said he would do. And so he was made a father of a multitude of peoples. God said to Abraham himself, you're going to have a big family, Abraham. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us just say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for the word that we've read. We're going to talk just for a few moments on the subject, righteous faith. Righteous faith. Faith that is righteous. Faith that is right. Righteous faith. Let's pray real quick. God, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Come on, give your neighbor a high five and tell them I got righteous faith. I got righteous faith. There's another topic I had that I was thinking about 
that was simply going to be when faith works for you. And it undergirds what I'm hoping we communicate today, that there is a use, a utility, a practice of faith that often is, uh, it feels a bit out of reach for many of us, that faith is simply a set of edicts, a set of, of, of belief systems, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, a theological or a church-based conversation of faith, we often uh, need to distinguish what kind of faith are we talking about. Are we talking about the kind of faith that is doctrinal? That is to say that faith that helps us become clear about the historical conversation and systems of belief that help us understand how we understand God, how we understand Jesus, how we understand salvation, how we understand the practices, whether they be communion or baptism or all these particular uh, practices that have over time been maintained by our consistent repetition of both belief and practices, doctrine, faith as doctrine. It is one way of talking about faith, but there is another way that we can and should talk about faith and understand faith, not in distinguishing or distinction from faith as doctrine, but we should also talk about faith as ethics, which is just to say, I may have my beliefs about God, but my beliefs about God must always be held in tension by my ethics, how I treat creation. You have a lot of people who can, man, give a whole treatise, write lots of books, preach lots of sermons, do all kind of great things with the doctrinal beliefs of faith. But when it comes to the actual ethics of faith, there is a significant disconnect. Anyone ever met someone who can talk the faith, but can't always live the faith. I know that's none of us in here ever, praise God, right? We, <laughs> we always, you know, we, we always got the two hooked up real good, right? Like, I, I, you know, I know what I believe, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, I also know what I do. And sometimes what I believe and what I do are not always in alignment with each other. I got a real church this morning, right? That there is this sense that we have a struggle with being able to make sure that our faith as doctrine is also aligned with our faith as ethics. But then there's a third kind of faith that is also, I, I believe, most uh, important in relationship to both your doctrine and your ethics, and it is this kind of faith that we see here in the text with Abraham. Now, in the book of Hebrews, another kind of tangential passage, particularly for today, faith is defined like this. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things you can't see. Everybody repeat that after me. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things we can't see. Come on, let's say it one more time. We're gonna act like you in Sunday school. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of what we can't see. Faith as doctrine, faith as ethics, but faith as a divine gift from God that allows you and I to have hope beyond what we can see. And I want to say to you, beloved, that if there is a kind of faith you and I must cultivate, it is this kind of faith that allows us to not be limited by what we can see. 
because there are too many things that happen in our lives that require faith beyond what you can see. Hello, somebody. Anybody ever had an experience in your life where you know that I cannot explain this outcome, but I know it had to be God? Some people narrate it like, man, I'm living on my grandmama prayers. That's faith. Man, I'm living on my mama and my, my, my dad or my, 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 my cousin. Uh, they, 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 they be praying for me, and, and I'm out here just skating on somebody else's prayers. Anybody ever skated on a prayer? You know you didn't pray yet. And then when you got out the situation, you started praying, and your prayer was just simply, thank you, God. I don't know. Maybe I'm talking to myself this morning. I'm just, you know, uh, it, it is important to appreciate that the faith that is often beyond what you can see is the kind of faith that activates God's favor and plans in your life. And our task as we, you know, create disciples of Jesus here at The Way is to help you learn how can I distinguish, cultivate, and activate a faith that works when I'm not at church. <laughs> because that's a whole nother thing. Some of us got faith while we at church, and then when we're not at church, we got other things that we rely on. But I want to submit to you and I that whether it is your doctrine, whether it is your ethics, and as we cultivate this divine gift of faith, they all must work when we leave church. Because faith is not intended to be a performance at church. Faith is intended to be activated, cultivated introduced it is intended to be a space where i know that if i can't get it anywhere else i can sign up to show up on a gathering on a meetup and appreciate that there's going to be some folk here helping me to activate this faith and this is why it is so important for you and i to appreciate that i must believe beyond what i can see I must hope for beyond what is deemed possible. I must have a certain kind of posture that allows me to say beyond the shadow of a doubt that God, my faith is righteous because it is both grounded in a set of beliefs. It is both expressed in a set of actions, but it is always attached to something that is supernatural. And why is such attachments so critical for the child of God? Well, the scriptures, I believe, give us a little bit of an insight, at least for Abraham, on several things. Abraham, uh, someone who is at the end of his life being given a massive promise by God, Abraham didn't follow God's, you know, uh, plan after he was given the promise in a straight line. If you read the text, you'll find that Abraham, you know, said, okay, God said I'm going to get a baby, uh, but obviously, you know, I don't have one, so I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm a do it another way, and I'm going I'm to, I'm you know, uh, take advantage, you know, because Abraham had a power dynamic, obviously, with his maid servant, and, you know, uh, probably, you know, put her in a you know, awkward, crazy position, and they conceived the child. The child's name was Ishmael, and, and, and Abraham was like, cool, I got this promise fulfilled. It's like, God's like, well, that's not what I had in mind. Anyone ever, like, try to take a shortcut or another way, and then you, you still get what you got, but it ain't a substitute for what God promised. So you didn't have to live with this decision, but it does not nullify God's promise. Which is just to say that one of the most important things we must hold when we talk about righteous faith in this passage, it powerfully declares that the faith in verse number 13, the promise that you would inherit the world. 
God told Abraham, you will have many children and you would inherit the world. That promise was not nullified because Abraham decided to take a shortcut. I want you to believe, child of God, that you can inherit the world. The world, God's promise, that thing that is within your grasp or even sometimes outside of your grasp, you and I with righteous faith can inherit the world. And what does that mean? Well, in this text, it is obvious that God is promising Abraham that you will have lineage. You will have uh, successors. You will have sons. You will have uh, daughters. You will have a nation that flows from your ability to believe. If you can believe, you can't inherit the world. Now, one of the most important things that I think is, 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 is a risk for us is that sometimes we mistake our ambition for stewardship. Or dare I say, we mistake or, or allow our ambition to get in the way of our stewardship. There are people out here who have such an imperialistic or hegemonic or this control factor when it comes to inheriting God's promise or receiving God's promise or, or, or moving into a place where you are literally taking authority and position that you forget that everything God gives you is so you can steward, you can take care of, you can oversee or serve in a way that creates and produces life. Can you imagine or can you think of the places in your life where you are being invited to inherit the world, to receive a promise and not being able to acknowledge that, man, perhaps it is my ambition, my intent to go beyond, go beyond my, my own internal drive for Success, for power, for notoriety, for popularity. One of the greatest challenges I believe we have in our current society is that there is a, 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 uh, our, our, our minds, our, our, our personalities, our, our, our drive to be uh, popular and affirmed have been mediated through the social media platforms where much of what we do, if it is not producing a certain level of affirmation, we judge our impact or effectiveness by the approval of people that we often don't see and won't even know. And allow those who God have placed in our life their opinions of us fade to the background. This is most true with, in my experience, of our younger folks, but I find it true with adults as well. I can't tell you how many times we've, I've, you know, tried to, I, I remember I, I, I was talking to my, my, my social media team and, and um, we were talking about how we can continue to build our, our public facing messages about the issues we care the most about. And they, they said, well, you know, Pastor Mike, you have a couple posts that have gone viral. What did you do to make those viral? I said, I don't know. <laughs> the things that I thought or I hope would go viral that I spent a lot of time thinking about gets like, five likes man. and the things and this is no lie the things that I spend the least amount of time thinking about you know post it and it just blows up and it is interesting the things that blow up often give me the most trolls and hate mail and you you know and and I'd be like man maybe that's because I didn't think it through but there was a certain kind of truth that I had to reckon with is that there are some moments and seasons in your life 
where even with all of your planning and intentionality, you may not get the result you want or expect. But the question is, can you still take care of what God has placed in your hands without the like, without the affirmation, without the acknowledgement, appreciating that the promise of God that you would inherit the world, you would get everything God intended for you, may not come through a direct result of your intentionality. It will come through the promise and the gift of God. So I do have a question. Do you, do you have the faith to inherit the world? Do you have, do we have the faith that can stand still and wait for God to move after we've done our part or while we're doing our part or when we've done our part and it seems like nothing is changing? Can we have an honest assessment about our ambition and is it getting in the way of our stewardship? Second thing real quick, that I believe that faith that works for us, a faith that is righteous faith, is that it helps us create community and restore relationship. Now one of the great things I love about faith that is righteously applied is that it cultivates community and does not push us towards isolation. We talked for a little while in our TLC meeting, our team leaders meeting yesterday. We've been thinking about this a little bit here at The Way for quite some time, particularly coming out of the pandemic. What does it mean for us to have a faith that is broad enough to cultivate community among us who may often find ourselves experiencing isolation, exclusion, rejection, and loneliness? What does it mean to appreciate that faith Rightly applied creates the the environment for us to literally have lives that are shared and relationships that are restored. That faith flows out of a deep sense of appreciation that God, I am here not because I have all the right beliefs. I am here not because I have all the right actions. I am here because this is an overflowing of God's divine gift. And if I'm here because of God's divine gift, guess what? I can't judge anyone else as they are here. Because there are days when I don't get it right and God still invites me into community. There are moments that I step out of the boundary of what may be appropriate, and God still invites me into community. God invites us into lives of shared accountability. Why? So we can, as iron sharpens iron, help one another grow into the image, as the scripture says, of God's reflection. It is just to say that in community, you become a better follower of Jesus. In community, you become a more faithful version of yourself. In community, you are healed. In community, you are delivered. In community, you are set free. In community, you learn more about the God of all creation. In community, you practice things that you could not do on your own. I was talking with a friend of mine, and uh, she was trying to, you know, uh, get me to go uh, to the gym, uh, sign up for a thing to do Pilates. And I, you know, I said, okay, you know, she's telling me all about it. You know, she lives in New York, and, you know, she was just telling me how Pilates have changed her life. And, and you know, I was like, wow, that's, that's what's up. I was like, can I do them at home by myself? <laughs> she was like, what's wrong with you? I was like, what do you mean? Like, it was just, it was an innocent question. Like, I'm not, you know, because, you know, Pilates don't, you know, I like, I'm going to go live weights. That sounds like something more that I probably would want to do with, you know, she was talking about Pilates, and I was thinking to myself, man, can I see myself doing a Pilates in public with a bunch of other people? Maybe I should do that at home by myself, a Pilates. And, you know, she got frustrated with me, and so we ended the conversation about Pilates. But, 
But, but the whole point that I appreciated about her admonition to me is that there are some things you can't do by yourself. And I said, oh, but you know, there's COVID at the Pilates gym. She's like, Pastor Mike, come on. They, they wipe everything down. I was like, but I know but they, don't, they don't do nothing to the air. Making up a lot of excuses why I would not participate in a communal practice that when done could change my life. Some of us have gotten so used to being on our own, being isolated, and we don't like it. There's not a lot of people who just love being by themselves. I mean, there are some of us who are introverted, who like, you know, get a lot of energy from not being around a whole lot of people, right? But that's very different than being alone, being isolated. Experiencing loneliness. Sometimes we must not allow our disposition to create a permanent condition. Sometimes I got to push myself. Coming to church, oh, uh, I can do this at home alone. Yes, you can, but you know, there's a reason why we try to do build community. And you know, you may not come to church, but we have other ways of meeting. We got Folk who hike through the mountains of the Bay Area. <laughs> in the rain and in the sunshine. Hopefully the rain is gone and we ain't got to, well, they ain't got to <laughs> brave those conditions <laughs> anymore. I ain't going to say the snow because we'll have snow here unless you're going up to the place where snow's coming. But it's a gift to be able to know that even though I could go hiking alone, I'm hiking with some people. And in community, this beautiful practice becomes more beautiful. How many of you can acknowledge that there are seasons in my life where loneliness, isolation, and exclusion make me less likely to show up in spaces of community that is intentionally curated to be so, right? Sometimes you need a curated, intentional communal space rather than just a haphazard, oh, we just in community together. Sometimes the community you're in at your job, at your house, in your neighborhood is a community you kind of trying to get away from. Anybody ever need a break from community? Oh, I need a break from this community. <laughs> I just I need a break. I, you know, I, I, I'm not saying I hate this community. I just need a break. Time out. Vacation. <laughs> Curating other spaces allows us to sustain the gift of community. That is a result of righteous faith. And then the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll lift up and we'll, we'll let folks go is righteous faith allows us to see beyond death and lifeless circumstances. Again, Abraham's body was dead. His wife Sarah's body was dead, meaning they were not able to produce life. And yet God made them a promise and invited them to believe beyond their circumstances. I'm not going to belabor this point, but we know that there are conditions in our world, in our neighborhoods, in our region, our city, our own lives, that if taken at face value, all we see is death. Lifeless circumstances. Faith is a ignition for you to not be overly determined by what you see. When it's presented only as death. Now, there are a lot of people who lose faith because we often see too much death. There are a lot of us, I were a lot of young men, young folk, who's lost so many loved ones to violence or they themselves have been overly impacted by uh, injustice or abandonment, and so they don't have the, the muscle for faith. They become hopeless because hopelessness has been there 360 years 
degree context. But I have also seen faith ignite in the midst of hopelessness. Not because of what you do, but because it is a gift from God. When you go to therapy, you are doing an act of faith. Because you're saying, I will not allow this circumstance to rob me of my ability to have hope sparked in the midst of my hopelessness. When you do acts of justice, you are literally igniting faith or demonstrating that faith has been ignited. There are some folks who often ask me, why are we speaking out against war, genocide, do you really think your actions make a difference? The history of human progress has often hinged on a small group of folk believing that their voice and their actions against all odds change what seems to be inevitable. If history is borne that out, why would we stop having faith that it can happen in your own life first? In your family first, in your community first, in our country first, in the world first. God has always ignited faith in a few groups of folk to change and inherit the world. And my prayer for us today is that, God, may you ignite this faith, righteous faith, in me. Give me the faith to see beyond my circumstance. May I be like Abraham, who's getting promises from God at a stage of my life where, God, you own one. This certainly can't happen. And then may God surprise you in a way that reminds you that faith is a gift, and that gift is being extended to us. Stand with me, everyone, and let's take a few moments to pray. Grab the hand of someone if you don't mind. God, we are a people who constantly are struggling to hold on to faith, in the midst of hard circumstances. We don't diminish the challenges we face, but God, we want to declare that there is faith that is a gift that has been extended to us. As I touch my beloved, loved one, family member, friend, I pray today, God, that you will help them to see and to know that there is faith for them, a faith that is a gift to them, a faith that allows them to see beyond circumstances that are lifeless or that are death-filled, a faith that allows them to reach for, cultivate, and participate in a community, and a faith that allows them to believe that every promise you made, they can't inherit their world. I pray, God, that you will unlock faith for them. I pray that you will unlock faith that is undeniably a gift. That they know at the moment of its unlocking that something new has broken into my existence. Faith for their healing faith for restored relationships, faith for a future, faith for a past that does not drag them back into a time and season of hopelessness. I pray, God, that you will bless who I'm touching today. May they see you and find you and know you. And may it be done in ways that 
bring you honor and glory. Lift those hands where you're standing. God, I pray for my own circumstance and situation today. I know that it's me standing in the need of prayer. There are circumstances and situations today that often make me feel like the promise of God, the activity of God, the work of God has gone or I have outlived the fulfillment of these promises. I pray today, God, that you will visit and remind me that your promises do not have an expiration date. But the gift of faith that you've given to me can ignite, reignite, restore, and it can, Lord, give me a new path into a future I've hoped and prayed for. I pray for healing in the hands that are lifted. I pray for hope in the hands that are lifted. I pray for power. I pray for strength. I pray for faith that works for the world we are to inherit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them again, I have righteous faith. You have righteous faith. We have some righteous faith. If you believe that, come on, give the Lord a hand. Praise everybody. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord.